everyone and welcome to your biology course. These video narrations are meant to act as your lecture portion for the course since we are not having in-person classes at the moment and each video will be anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour which means that these narrations are pretty dense with zero fluff. But the beautiful thing about videos is when you need a break or you feel a little bit of cognitive fatigue, you can pause and always come back. Before we begin though, I'd like to just give you my suggestions on how to structure your study workflow. I always get questions from students about this. But as always, do what you feel is best for you and your learning process. All right, step one would be to skim through your PowerPoint lecture. Through this, you should get the main idea of what this chapter is all about, pay attention to any bolded words and key concepts, and identify the main topics and subtopics. This is a really important step because this quick skim acts as a little cognitive primer for you. It gives you a scaffold to layer the coming information onto. And the more you organize your information, the better the retention will be for you. I suggest printing out PowerPoint lectures with four slides to a page and taking notes on this. Step two would be to watch this lecture narration and follow along with your printed out lecture slides. Pause where you need, take notes. Just remember that the suggested amount of study time for a course, and especially a STEM course like this, is three hours per credit. And I believe this is a four credit course, which means 12 hours per week. Um, you have access to videos now, podcasts, everything, which kind of helps to lower the amount of time. These videos, like I said, are anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. So you know, take advantage of the fact that you have this now that people a couple generations back did not have. Step three would be to clarify with textbook or outside sources. Uh, use these sources to explain concepts that you don't understand from the PowerPoint or from how I narrated it. Um, useful resources include your textbook, the MyLab and Mastering information that's associated with your textbook, Obviously, YouTube has some great resources and other, you know, various science pages that you can just Google. Step four would be to fill in your notes. Add any helpful or interesting information you feel will help you understand and retain the information. Step five would be to watch this narration again. This time you should be very familiar with 90% of the content, including vocab words, concepts, biological processes that are explained and follow along with your printed and now written and filled out lecture notes. There's a lot of science that supports the mind-hand connection. Writing helps retain what you learn and repetition of looking at your own writing with these you know, foreign concepts that you're learning will greatly help as well. The name of the game for biology is retention. You don't want to continue to have to relearn these concepts for the next four years because you better bet that you're going to see this. When you go into anatomy, the first two chapters or three chapters or so is your entire biology course that you're going to be learning this semester. So retention is the name of the game. Step five would be complete the my lab and mastering biology homework. The homework again is a reinforcer now. It should be easier since you've gone over all of the concepts. And um, I do encourage you to try to figure it out on your own, the homework, and then consult your notes for confirmation. Step six, the final step would be to complete the quiz for this chapter or module. All right, so without further ado, let's get into chapter one. This first chapter is more of a sweeping view of biology. As we'll see, biology is a broad field focused on the study of life. We'll touch on some unifying themes in biology, organization and hierarchy, Darwin and the theory of evolution, and we'll finish off with the scientific method. In each lecture narration, I'll also briefly list the chapter objectives at the beginning of each PowerPoint. So in this chapter, students will differentiate between living and non-living entities. In particular, you will be able to describe how living organisms differ from non-living entities, describe the hierarchy of biological organization from the cell to the biosphere, and be able to relate structures and function through the levels, 
describe the fundamental evolutionary hierarchy of biological organization and associated taxonomy, describe some fundamental ecological concepts and relevance to biological organization, and describe and relate the fundamentals of Darwinian evolution. It's fitting that the first word we define in a biology course is biology. So biology is the scientific study of life. Biologists ask important questions such as, how does a single cell develop into an entire organism? Biology is a quest, an ongoing inquiry about the nature of life, and life defies a simple one-sentence definition. It's recognized by what living things do. So here we see seven processes associated with all forms of life. They are order, energy and energy processing, growth and development, evolutionary adaptation, response to the environment, regulation and reproduction. Because these processes are all attributed to the activities of life and things that are alive, I'm confident you can come up with examples of each of these processes. As a quick exercise, pause and take a moment to think of a topic in biology, literally any topic. Then see which of the seven life processes it can slot under. It may even be categorized under more than one. We're going to see these life processes in depth throughout this course, and as you move through your own major courses, you will see these exemplified over and over and over again. So I think we've established that biology is a subject of enormous scope, and while the topics and subjects can cover anything from how a bumblebee flies to the effect that eating sweets has on dopamine levels, there are five unifying themes among all aspects of biology that you need to know. So those five unifying themes are organization, information, energy and matter, interactions, and evolution. An organism's adaptations to its environment are the result of evolution, which is the process of change that has transformed life on Earth. Just note that these are different from the seven life processes that we discussed in the previous slide. The seven life processes are the actions and things that organisms actually do. The five unifying themes that you see here are more of fundamental and universal ideas that tie all living processes of living things together. You can probably choose any of the seven life processes and attribute them to more than one of the unifying themes. I'll give a quick example. Let's take reproduction. Which of the unifying themes do you think reproduction can represent? I'd say organization. The human body is organized in a specific way to allow for the formation of sex cells and sex organs. Information. The DNA in our cells determines our ability to reproduce. Interactions. The sexual organs, such as ovaries, are in tight feedback loops with the pituitary in our brain, and our hormones are powerful effectors of behaviors and moods which can alter how we interact with other individuals, and of course evolution. I think we can attribute almost any living thing in existence to evolution. So let's take a look into each theme. Theme 1, new properties emerge at successive levels of biological organization. We can study life at different levels, from molecules to the entire living planet, from the microscopic to the macroscopic. This enormous range can be divided into different levels of biological organization or biological hierarchy. In the image on the right, we see 10 levels of organization. We're going to walk through these from the microscopic up to the macroscopic, but before we do, we need to cover the concept of emergent properties. Emergent properties are what result from the arrangement and interaction of parts within a system. And we can use this term to categorize both living and non-living things. Take a bicycle as an example. A usable bicycle emerges only when all of the necessary parts connect in the correct way, right? If you're missing any parts, such as a wheel or the handlebars or the chain, the bike won't work. Similarly, if you have all the correct pieces, but 
they are not assembled correctly, the bike also won't work. Each part of the bike has its own function. Just think of all the things a wheel or a chain can be used for apart from a bike. A wheel has its own properties. Now when we take many parts and put them together in a new way, we create something new with brand new properties that the parts alone would not have. These new properties are called emergent properties. Just look at anything in the room you're in. See all the individual pieces and identify their properties. Then identify the emergent properties when they're all properly assembled together into that new item. And we can study these living and non-living entities at differing levels. The reductionist approach studies the isolated components of a system. So in our bike example, a reductionist might only study the function of a wheel. To explore emergent properties, biologists complement reductionism with systems biology. And systems biology is the analysis of the interactions among the different parts of a system. Systems biology can be used to study life at all levels also. I'm sure you can think of many types of doctors or scientists that use the systems biology approach. A reductionist scientist may simply study protein structure and basic function while an immunologist may study how specific proteins trigger immune responses in an organism. So let's return to our levels of organization. Keep in mind this idea of emergent properties as we move through the differing levels of organization. We'll begin at the microscopic and increase our scope up to the macroscopic. So we're going to start with molecules. Molecules are groups of elements specifically arranged into unique units. We'll learn more about molecules in a later chapter. Do a quick brainstorm to identify molecules for yourself. To name a few, there's oxygen, carbon dioxide, triglycerides, DNA, RNA, glucose, and acetone. When molecules are organized in a specific way, we form organelles. Organelles are specialized compartments within a cell. These include mitochondria, chloroplast, the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi apparatus. We'll learn all of the organelles and their functions in chapter 6. When organelles are arranged in a specific way, cells are formed. The cell is the smallest unit of organization that can perform all activities required of life. Note that things below the organization of a cell are not considered alive. Every cell is enclosed by a membrane which regulates the passage of materials between and into and out of the cell and its environment, and we'll see more about membranes and transport in Chapter 7. The cells of bacteria and archaea are what we call prokaryotic, while all other forms of life are composed of eukaryotic cells, and we'll return to this in just a moment. So we see that when organelles are arranged in the proper way, life is the emergent property, as well as all of the functions associated with the living cell. Can you think of any particular types of cells? I'm sure that you can, I'll just name a few. You have cardiocytes in the heart, myocytes, which are muscle cells, adipocytes, which store lipids, hepatocytes in the liver, osteocytes in the bone, neurocytes in the central and peripheral nervous system, melanocytes in your skin, sex cells, um, which are the sperm and the egg, plant, plant cells, fungi cells, and bacteria. And remember that all of the cells in your body contain the same DNA, yet your neurons and your cardiocytes are very different in both appearance and function. And this is because they express different proteins and contain different organelles, which allows them their differing functions and emergent properties. Now, when we group similar cells together, we form tissues. Try to come up with a couple of types of tissues. I'll name a few here. You have muscle tissue, bone, adipose, cartilage, epithelial tissue, and blood. And yes, blood is actually a type of tissue. And you'll learn all about the four main types of tissues in anatomy and physiology. When we group different tissues together, 
we make organs. And I'm sure you can name some of your own vital organs. You have the heart, the lung, kidney, liver, intestines, reproductive organs, stomach, bladder, and the brain, just to name a few. And when we group specific organs together, we create the organism. To name a few broad categories of organisms, we have animals, plants, fungi, archaea, and bacteria. And of course, I'm sure you can list many, many organisms within each of those groups that I just listed. Now our groupings are moving outside of the individual and we're moving toward interactions between whole organisms and their environment. So when we group organisms together, we create populations. And we can say college biology students are a population of people. We can also say Central Floridians are a population of people. And when we group different populations together, we create communities. So the population of college biology students and the population of college economic students and all other populations create the college community. Or we can say that the population of Central Floridians and the population of birds in Central Florida and the population of palm trees in Central Florida, etc., make up the Central Florida community. When we group communities together, we create ecosystems. Examples of ecosystems are forests, coral reefs, freshwater rivers and lakes, mangroves, rainforests, deserts, the beach, grasslands, and the tundra. And finally, the worldwide sum of all ecosystems is called the biosphere. On February 14th of 1990, almost over 30 years ago, NASA's Voyager 1 spacecraft captured the very first image of Earth. This picture, which would become known as the pale blue dot, shows Earth within a scattered ray of sunlight. The image inspired the title of scientist Carl Sagan's book, The Pale Blue Dot, A Vision of the Human Future in Space, in which he wrote, look again at that dot, that's here, that's home, that's us. I like to remember this image when I need some perspective, and I'll link Sagan's beautiful narration of the pale blue dot in the description box below. You now know the 10 levels of biological hierarchy. At each level of the hierarchy, we find a correlation between structure and function. This simply means that if we analyze any biological structure, it gives us a clue about what it does and how it works. And conversely, knowing the function of something can provide insight into its structure and organization. As an example, look at these homologous structures. These are various versions of upper appendages. If a scientist discovered a set of bones with a similar structure at a dig site, they would be able to use the correlation between structure and function to determine what it was for and how it worked. All right, let's return to cells. Again, a cell is the smallest unit of life. It's capable of all of the activities required for life. And there are two main types of cells. We have eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. Simply put, a eukaryotic cell has organelles, the largest of which is usually the nucleus. By comparison, a prokaryotic cell is simpler and usually smaller and does not contain a nucleus or any other organelles. In this image, we see a large eukaryotic cell and a small prokaryotic cell next to it. In the large eukaryotic cell, we can distinctly see the large purple nucleus and smaller membrane-enclosed organelles in maroon and orange throughout. Whereas in that prokaryotic cell, there are no organelles, just an area of concentrated DNA floating freely. We'll learn more about cells in chapter 6. And on to theme 2, life's processes involve the expression and transmission of genetic information. I'm sure you're all familiar with the molecule responsible for carrying our inherited genetic information. Within all cells, every type of cell, there are structures called chromosomes which contain genetic material in the form of DNA. And do note this, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And we'll see what all of that means later too. 
Every single cell in existence contains its own form of chromosome and DNA. In this image, they have tagged certain proteins to better visualize the cell, and this cell is going through division. The blue color represents the DNA, while the green and red are cytoskeleton components and mitotic spindle. And again, we'll learn a little bit more about those later. So what is a chromosome? A chromosome is a long molecule of DNA, and on each of those there are hundreds or thousands of genes. For humans, we have 46 chromosomes, and altogether it carries anywhere between 20,000 and 23,000 genes. Genes are what we call the units of inheritance, and they encode directions for building the molecules made within the cell mostly proteins. In this way, genetic information encoded by DNA directs the development of an organism. And as we move through this course, you'll learn more and more about the structure of DNA. And we know that the molecular structure of DNA is what allows it to store this genetic information. Each DNA molecule is made up of two long chains of DNA arranged in a double helix. Each chain is made up of four different kinds of chemical building blocks that are called nucleotides. And note that, they're called nucleotides. So we have four nucleotides, A, G, C, and T. And that's all you need to know for now. We'll go into the names and the structure a little bit later. We always say that DNA encodes genetic information, and for many genes, that means that the sequence of the DNA provides the blueprint for making a protein. This idea about the flow of information has a special name that you should note called central dogma. In the central dogma, DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into a protein. This flow of genetic information is the process of gene expression, and you'll hear me say that term gene expression all throughout the course and that just means that your body is reading the DNA and making a specific gene. We're expressing that gene. You can have the DNA in the cell and not be expressing it. We can turn on and turn off the expression of certain genes. So gene expression is the process of converting information from gene to cellular product. In this image, we see the gene expression of a protein called crystalline. Crystalline is a special protein that's found in the lens of your eye, which has a transparent property to it, allowing for light to travel through. The DNA encodes the special sequence of nucleotides, again, A, T, C, or G, which are then transcribed into the mRNA, and then the mRNA is translated into an amino acid sequence, and fold it into the crystalline protein. Make sure you know and understand this flow of information. It's very, very important as we go deeper into later chapters. All of the DNA and genes make up an organism's genome, which is its entire library of genetic instructions. Modern technological advancements have allowed scientists to better gather, characterize, and study genomes. Genomics is the study of sets of genes in one or more species. Scientists may also study proteins in a cell. Proteomics is the study of whole sets of proteins and their properties. The entire set of proteins expressed by a given cell, tissue, or organ is called a proteome. So we have the genome, which is the entire set of genes, genetic information, and then we have the proteome, which is the entire set of proteins. I want to stress just how much information your cells contain. In 1990, a massive endeavor was launched with the objective of determining the DNA sequence of an entire human genome. It was completed 13 years later, and the 6 billion nucleotide genome was printed in books. This ability to study genomes depends on what we call high throughput technology, which yields enormous amounts of data. It's just the ability to gather and store and organize massive amounts of data. Bioinformatics, which is the use of computational tools to process large volumes of data, uh, is also important. 
And there needs to be interdisciplinary research teams who span the skills necessary to blend that cutting edge genetics with state of the art technology. Unifying theme number three is life requires the transfer and transformation of energy and matter. Take a look at this energy flow diagram. Notice how it begins at the left with light energy and flows toward the right where organisms such as plants and animals are. The input of energy from the sun and the transformation of energy from one form to another make life possible, but it all begins with the sun. Producers such as plants turn light energy from the sun and transform it into what we call chemical energy via the process of photosynthesis. And we will go further into photosynthesis in chapter 10. That chemical energy that was made by plants and other photosynthetic organisms, which we call producers, is passed along to consumers. Consumers are organisms that feed on other organisms or their remains for energy. In this example, the caterpillar is feeding off of the plant. It's acting as a consumer. Consumers use that chemical energy to perform work. When organisms use energy to perform work, some energy is lost to the surroundings as heat. And I'm sure you've realized this. If you go near an animal or another human, you can feel the heat coming off of them. And that's a result of their own biological, biochemical processes. As a result, energy flows through an ecosystem, usually entering as light and exiting as heat. Chemical cycles also exist where they are used and then recycled over and over again. Theme four is all about interactions. From molecules to ecosystems, interactions are important in biological systems. And interactions can happen at any of the levels of organization that we've gone over today. Interactions between components of a system, whether it's organs and tissues or cells and molecules, all of those interactions that make up living organisms are crucial for smooth operation. One crucial ability of living organisms is the ability to maintain what we call homeostasis, which are internal steady conditions. Many biological processes can self-regulate through a special mechanism called feedback. In feedback regulation, the output or product of a process regulates that very process. The most common form of regulation in living organisms is what we call negative feedback. In negative feedback, the response reduces the initial stimulus. And then the other type of feedback is called positive feedback. Positive feedback is much less common than negative feedback. In positive feedback, an end product speeds up its own production. This is an example of a negative feedback system, or sometimes you might hear a negative feedback loop. This shows the interactions between glucose in the blood and insulin. Glucose is the most abundant sugar in your body. It's used by your cells to create energy, ATP. We're gonna learn about this in chapter nine. When you eat a meal, your body digests it and breaks it down to glucose. This causes an increase in glucose levels in your blood. In the image, glucose is the green hexagon. High blood glucose stimulates your pancreas to secrete a hormone called insulin. Insulin is the hormone that helps to regulate your blood glucose levels. Insulin circulates throughout the body and binds to cells causing them to take up the glucose out of the blood. This efficiently removes glucose from the blood, and in addition, insulin triggers the liver cells to pull in and store glucose into glycogen. The lowered blood glucose no longer stimulates insulin secretion. Again, a negative feedback loop is one in which the response reduces the stimulus or negates it. That's why it's called a negative feedback. Insulin was stimulated by high glucose. Insulin acted to reduce glucose and therefore glucose was no longer stimulating insulin secretion. I do want to emphasize that a negative feedback does not mean that it always reduces the stimulus. High glucose caused this negative feedback loop. 
but low glucose can also cause a negative feedback loop. Low glucose will stimulate a different hormone to release glucose back into the blood, thereby increasing blood glucose levels. Negative feedback just means that it negates the original. So if, if something was too high, the negative feedback will lower it. And if it was too low, the negative feedback will higher it. This is an example of a positive feedback loop. In positive feedback loops, the end product stimulates its own production. These are quite rare in the body and are typically found in the female reproductive system. This example is childbirth. I won't go deep into the mechanism because it's beyond the scope of this class, but briefly, when it's time for a mother to give birth, the brain releases oxytocin to stimulate contractions that will force the baby into the birthing canal. When the tissues of the birthing canal are stretched by the baby, another signal is sent back up to the brain to stimulate more oxytocin release. And so more contractions are stimulated and the baby moves further down the birthing canal. Notice how oxytocin release is resulting in more oxytocin release. This process will not stop until the cause of the stimulus is released or removed, in this case, birth. At the ecosystem level, each organism interacts with other organisms, and these interactions may be beneficial or harmful to one or both of the organisms. In this image, we see the interplay between a tree, which uses light energy to create chemical energy, an elephant, which eats the chemical energy from the tree to do work, and the earth and soil, which holds water and minerals for the tree to take up. This is a nice depiction of the circle of life. And finally, theme five is the core theme, evolution. Evolution accounts for the unity and diversity of life. Evolution is the one idea that makes logical sense of everything we know about living organisms. The scientific explanation for both the unity and diversity of organisms is evolution, the concept that living organisms are modified descendants of common ancestors. There is an abundance of evidence that supports the occurrence of evolution. The noted evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins once said, you can't even begin to understand biology, you can't understand life unless you understand what it's all there for, how it arose, and that means evolution. Scientists go to great lengths to classify all of this diversity that is found among living organisms. To date, we've already identified and named about 1.8 million species. And for that naming process, there's a special term for it. It's called binomial nomenclature. Binomial means two names. And that two-part name that we give them, we use the genus and the species. So for example, humans, our nomenclature name is Homo sapiens. And I just want you to take note of how that's written. The genus is always capitalized, so Homo is our genus that's capitalized, and the species is lowercase, so that would be sapiens. You'll also notice that it's italicized. So although we've already identified 1.8 million species, Estimates for the total number of species that actually exist range upwards from 10 million to over 100 million, and that's a pretty big range, but there are still ecosystems that we have just begun to explore, such as the deep sea. Now we have a special branch of biology that deals with this classification of living and extinct organisms, and that's called taxonomy. And there are eight levels of the taxonomic classification system and you should note these, and they are domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. We divide organisms into three domains, and they are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The prokaryotes, remember those are cells with no organelles, they're the simplest cells, they're also the oldest cells. They include the domains bacteria and archaea. The domain eukarya includes all the eukaryotic organisms, which makes sense, right? That's an easy one to remember. Within the domain eukarya, we have different kingdoms. So we have four, protists, plants, fungi, and animals. Protists, for the most part, are single-celled organisms. And you know that all of the 
um, prokaryotes, all of the bacteria and archaea are also single-celled, but those are prokaryotes. They do not have organelles. Protists are eukaryotes, so they're single-celled, but they do have organelles. So just note that. And interestingly enough, they are the most numerous and diverse of all of the eukaryotes. And some protists are less closely related to other protists than they are to plants. So there are some protists that are more genetically uh, similar to plants than to protists within their own kingdom. Now, while there may be upwards of 10 million plus species in existence today, there is a striking unity that underlies the diversity of all forms of life. For example, the use of DNA. DNA is the universal genetic language common to all organisms. We also see unity in many features of the cell. For example, we're looking at cilia here. We're comparing cilia from a paramecium, which is a single-celled organism that lives in fresh water, and the cilia from cells of our own respiratory tract. We are comparing a cross-section, and we see that they are in fact the same structure. And we can use fossils and other evidence like this to document the history of life and how Earth has changed through the last 4.6 billion years. Now, no discussion on evolution is complete without mentioning this man, Charles Darwin. Darwin published his revolutionary work called On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection in 1859. In this book, Darwin made two main points, and make sure you note these. Species showed evidence of what he called descent with modification from common ancestors, and natural selection is the mechanism behind descent with modification. Darwin's theory on evolution explained the duality of unity and diversity. So what did Darwin actually observe in the Galapagos Islands, which led to these two main points of his hypothesis? First, he noticed that individuals in a population vary in their traits, and many of these traits seem to be heritable. Here we see a sketch of Darwin's finches, illustrated by Darwin himself. Darwin noted the remarkable diversity in their beak form and function. Their taxonomical names are also listed below. Second, he observed more offspring are produced than actually survived, and that competition is inevitable. And third, he observed species generally suit their environment. This brings us back to Darwin's finches and the diversity in their beaks. Scientists have correlated the structure of their beaks to their food source. Some finches ate hard seeds and needed shorter, more durable beaks, while others ate soft bugs lodged in the crevices of trees. These birds would need longer, more narrow beaks to feed. Darwin reasoned that individuals that are best suited to their environment are more likely to survive and reproduce, and that over time more individuals in a population will have those advantageous traits. Use this example as a visual for that. In this population of beetles, we see a variety of inherited colors. Some are darker and some are lighter. Well, these lighter beetles stand out in the environment and become a target for predators like this bird. This lighter color trait is then a disadvantage for individuals. And over time, there will be more lighter beetles eliminated and eaten than darker beetles. And if the lighter beetles are eaten before they're able to reproduce, they will not be able to pass on their light colored genes to the following generation. Only the survivors are the ones that reproduce and pass on their more favorable darker color trait. This leads to an increased frequency of traits that enhance survival. In this way, evolution occurs as the unequal reproductive success of individuals. The lighter beetles had a lower reproductive success than the darker beetles. The natural environment therefore selects for the propagation of beneficial traits, and this is what Darwin called natural selection. Darwin proposed that natural selection could cause an ancestral species to give rise to two or more descendant species. For example, the finch species of the Galapagos are descendant from a common ancestor, and this is what Darwin meant by descent with modification. 
Evolutionary relationships are often illustrated with tree-like diagrams that show ancestors and their descendants, like this tree of the Galapagos finches. The shared anatomy of mammalian limbs reflects the inheritance of the limb structure from a common ancestor, and fossils provide additional evidence of anatomical unity due to this descent with modification. Take another look at this taxonomy tree of Darwin's finches. Let's dissect it just a little. There are seven finches pictured and the common ancestor is labeled ancestral finch for you. So can you identify the common ancestor of the bottom four birds? This would be at the branch point labeled common ancestor of finches in genre and then the two that are listed. One thing to know about taxonomy, these birds were placed in relation to each other using mathematical models and the data gathered from genomics and bioinformatics. However, we may not actually know the common ancestor or have found fossil evidence yet. Using the data from their genes, we try to find the missing links and fill in the blanks. We also lose information about any species which have come into and out of existence over the last few billion years. Without their fossil records or a living descendant, we would not have a way of learning about them. Also keep in mind that taxonomy trees take many forms. You can also choose the scope of the information. This taxonomy tree, for example, contains all living organisms in existence. For the final portion of this lecture, we'll focus on the scientific method. Students will demonstrate competency in the application of critical thinking and scientific reasoning. In particular, you will learn to evaluate data and draw conclusions in a laboratory setting and compare and contrast biological processes and principles. Let's start with the definition of science. The word science is derived from Latin and means to know. Scientists use a process of scientific inquiry that includes making observations, forming logical hypotheses, and testing them. There are actually a few models of scientific inquiry. We follow the classical model, which actually derives from Aristotle. Scientific inquiry is the search for information and explanations of natural phenomena. There are two major methodologies for scientific innovation, discovery science and hypothesis-driven science. In discovery science, biologists describe natural structures and processes that they observe. This approach is based on both observation and the analysis of data. Data is the term we use to describe the observations that we record, and there are many types of data. The major categories of data are qualitative data and quantitative data. Qualitative data often take the form of descriptions. Quantitative data are expressed as numerical measurements and are usually organized into tables and graphs. As a quick example, take this color. What color is this? And what about this color? You probably thought blue for both, yet they are different. The qualitative data would be the description that you create for this, maybe ocean blue and dark blue. But that doesn't really help. Everyone will have a different way of describing this. So how can we improve our data collection for this? We need to put a number to it. If you've ever messed around with graphic design or even made something in Microsoft Word, you've seen this color wheel. And notice that each shade of blue has a specific color code associated with it. This would be a better piece of recorded data to describe this color. So overall, which type of data do you think is more useful and reliable? Quantitative data is definitely king here. Qualitative data often comes into play for questionnaire-based research, such as what might be done for psychology or sociology, behavior or cognitive science, but both have their benefits. And now we have hypothesis-driven science. In science, a hypothesis is an explanation based on observations and assumptions that leads to a testable prediction. And that last part is very important. It must lead to predictions that can be tested by making more observations or by performing additional experiments. Science that is not predictable is not very valid 
and we should be able to replicate findings over and over again. Just think of all of the ways predictability in science is used today. Electricity, we flip a switch and know that electrons will flow through our wires and power our electronics. Engines in our car, weather patterns. With enough sound data and proper analysis, we can even go backwards in time with our predictions. Geologists were able to use plate tectonics, fossil evidence, and other pieces of data to piece together the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea, which assembled 300 million years ago. And of course, the way that we gather all of our data is through experiments. And an experiment is a scientific test carried out under controlled conditions. We'll get back to the idea of controlled conditions shortly. Within scientific inquiry, we have two types of reasoning, inductive and deductive. Inductive reasoning draws conclusions through the logical process of induction. Repeating specific observations can lead to important generalizations. It is deriving general principles from specific observations. For example, the statement, the sun always rises in the east. If you wake up in the morning and observe that the sun rises in the east for a month and your friend has also noted this, you may use inductive reasoning by taking your observations and creating a generalized statement that it always rises in the east. Or the term all organisms are made of cells. You may have noticed from reading this textbook that the organisms we discuss are made of cells, or you may look at a leaf, a flower petal, and a slice of strawberry under a microscope and notice that they're all made of cells. You can then use inductive reasoning to say all organisms are made of cells. Deductive reasoning is kind of the opposite of inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning uses general premises to make specific predictions. Now, because there is such complexity to life, an initial observation may give rise to more than just one hypothesis. I might observe that leaves in the shade are a lighter green than leaves in the sun. My question would be, why are leaves in the shade lighter than leaves in the sun? All right, now what are some explanations? Let's come up with two. The amount of sunlight affects leaf color. And how about different fertilizations affect leaf color? So there we go. Those are our two explanations based on our observations and assumptions. In other words, those are two hypotheses. Notice how hypotheses are written as a statement. The amount of sunlight affects leaf color. Note that in science, we can never actually prove that a hypothesis is true, but testing it in many ways with different sorts of data can significantly increase our confidence in it. And generally, we won't say such and such experiment proved my hypothesis. We'll say this experiment supports my hypothesis that sunlight affects color. When forming hypotheses, we must always keep in mind that a hypothesis must be testable. This relates back to our definition of scientific inquiry, which is the search for information and explanations of natural phenomena. This is opposed to supernatural phenomena. For example, after observing your desk lamp suddenly move, a hypothesis that ghosts fooled around with the desk lamp cannot be tested. For this reason, supernatural and religious explanations are outside the bounds of science. I think now would be a good time to introduce the flow chart of the scientific method. We've actually already walked through the first four bubbles or so. You start with observing and asking a question. At this point, a scientist would do a little investigation in the science literature before embarking on a long and often expensive science experiment journey. Once the initial info is gathered, you form your hypothesis. Remember, always in the form of a statement. Then it's experimental design. I'd say this is actually the most difficult part of the scientific method. This is where uh, a real craft is involved in designing an experiment that will actually help you answer your question and address your hypothesis. 
You have to design it in such a way that your results can't possibly be from anything other than the thing that you're testing. So let's look at this a little deeper. Remember our definition of an experiment? An experiment is a scientific test carried out under controlled conditions. This part is key, controlled conditions. In a controlled experiment, we have two groups, the control group and the experimental group. I'm going to create a brand new scenario for this. Okay, let's say you're walking down the street and you notice that under a window are the most beautiful lush roses you've ever seen. And you think to yourself, how are those roses so vibrant and healthy? You also notice that a house down the street also has roses under a window, but those roses are not beautiful. They are dull and wilted with little growth. Then you hear soft piano music moving through the air and you realize that it is emanating from the window that the beautiful roses are blooming under. So we've made a few observations. Our question is, why are the roses under the piano window so vibrant in comparison to the other window? We quickly scan the neighborhood for additional clues and see if there are other houses with roses, but there are none. We'll call that our background research for the sake of this experiment. Now let's construct our hypothesis. The only difference you noticed was that one window had soft piano music emanating while the other didn't. And you can probably come up with a few solid testable hypotheses from all of this, but I'll use music affects the growth of roses. To be even more specific, I could say piano music increases growth of roses in Florida. Or to be more general, I could say music affects flower growth. See all the ways I could take a hypothesis. You'd want to be as specific as possible in a real lab experiment. The less variable, the better. So our hypothesis is music affects the growth of roses. And by the way, this is an example of inductive reasoning that we're using here. Our next step is to develop an experiment to test our hypothesis. We need to create two groups, the control group and the experimental group. I'll put four pots of roses in each group. The experimental group is going to be the roses with a parameter that we are testing, which is music. And the control group is then the group that lacks our experimental parameter. So no music for these roses. Now it's absolutely imperative to keep all other aspects of this experiment the same between the control group and the experimental group. These are called experimental variables. Variables are features or quantities that vary in an experiment. So again, we want to keep every single variable the same between the control group and the experimental group other than what we're testing. In this case, the only difference should be music or no music. This is very easy for our experiment, but can you imagine how this works when animals or uh, humans are the test subjects, you'd have to keep age, weight, amount of food intake, stress level, they'd all need to be held constant in a perfect world. Now there are two important types of variables you need to note, independent and dependent variables. The independent variable is the one that is manipulated by the researchers, while the dependent variable is the one predicted to be a in response. An easy way to remember this is I. I change the independent variable. I for independent. So what is our independent variable here? It would be music or no music. This is what I'm doing to the experiment. And the dependent variable is what we will be measuring because it is dependent on what we do in our experiment. In this case, it would be growth. Now, in creating a sound science experiment, we need to choose good dependent variables. Is the term growth qualitative or quantitative data? It has the potential to be both. I can look at a plant and notice general growth, and that's qualitative, as I would just be describing something about the plant. We want to ensure we have quantitative data, numbers, numbers, numbers. So let's set our dependent variable to stem growth in centimeters and always remember your units. We could actually find so many quantitative measures for this one. Leaf growth in centimeters, the amount of new leaves, petal growth, the amount of new buds formed. You get the point. The last variable we need to note and it's not in the slides, but control variables. These are all the other variables. 
the ones we want to hold the same across both groups. Can you quickly list some control variables? How about the amount and duration of sunlight, types of soil, amount of water, the, the time of day that it is watered, the type of rows, because there's different species, right? And temperature in the room. You get the point. Just remember that in a controlled experiment, we want all other variables held constant other than the one that we are testing. This becomes tricky, which is why proper experimental design is so key to great science. Okay, to finish up here, after we have collected our measurements, we analyze the data. This is also where we'd make graphs and charts. A quick note on graphs, you have the y-axis running vertical and the x-axis running horizontal. The independent variable always, always, always goes on the x-axis and the dependent variable is always on the y-axis. For our graph, I've made up some data and created a bar graph. Then we can use the data to draw conclusions. Here we see that music caused stem growth of the roses. This is where we check back with our hypothesis. This data supports our hypothesis that music affects the growth of roses. If we were part of a laboratory, we would have to repeat this experiment three times, then write up our findings in a science paper and submit it for review by our peers. I'll go more in depth into the process of how science literature is created, peer-reviewed, and published in a later video. Now, if our experiments looked something like this instead, this data does not support our hypothesis and we'd therefore have to revisit our original hypothesis. Luckily, there's flexibility in the scientific process. The scientific method is an idealized process of inquiry. However, very few scientific inquiries adhere rigidly to this approach. Backtracking and rethinking may be necessary partway through the process. Let's touch on theories in science. You're now a pro in formulating hypotheses, but when does something become elevated into a theory? In the context of science, a theory is much broader in scope than a hypothesis. Can you think of an example of a scientific theory? We have already talked about one in this lecture, the theory of evolution. There's also the quantum theory, the Big Bang theory, plate tectonics, and Einstein's theory of relativity, among others. And you'll notice from this list that theories are also quite general and can lead to new testable hypotheses. And finally, theories are supported by a large body of evidence in comparison to a hypothesis. In a nutshell, scientific theories are the most reliable, rigorous, and comprehensive forms of scientific knowledge. This is in contrast to more common uses of the word theory, which imply that something is unproven or just speculative, which is better characterized as a hypothesis, actually. Remember, we never really prove anything through the scientific method. We gather data to support a hypothesis or a theory. It's important to note that science not only benefits from but also requires a cooperative approach and diverse viewpoints. Most scientists work in teams, which often include graduate and undergraduate students. If you have the opportunity to do research in a lab, you will be working under a PI, which stands for a principal investigator. This PI would run a lab focused on a certain topic within a field and would have lab techs or graduate students under them running the lab experiments. Undergraduate students also have the opportunity to run some experiments and work closely with the PI lab techs or graduate students. This lab could also collaborate with other labs at their institution or in institutions across the world. Good communication is important in order to share results through seminars, publications, and websites. Scientists check each other's claims by performing similar experiments. If experimental results are not repeatable, the original claim will have to be revised. It is not unusual for different scientists to work on the same research question at the same time. As an aside to this, scientists are usually quite specialized and can spend their entire career researching the same protein or process in the body. 
Due to the specialization, science niches form in academia, and it's not uncommon for scientists across the world studying the same or similar things to be on first-name basis with each other. They'd certainly be well-versed in each other's research, as they need to constantly be up to date on the latest findings in their field. They also attend the science conferences across the globe where they can meet, share, and discuss their findings and techniques with fellow colleagues. One example of scientists cooperating is sharing data about model organisms. For example, the fruit fly Drosophila melangaster. And finally, we have science and technology in society. Now there's an interesting topic, and one that definitely bridges controversial discussions on ethics and the role that science and tech should play in our lives. The goal of science is to understand natural phenomena, remember, not supernatural, and the goal of technology is to apply scientific knowledge for some specific purpose. Biology is marked by discoveries, while technology is marked by inventions. You wouldn't say that cells were invented or that spacecrafts were discovered. This dynamo combination of science and technology has dramatic effects on society. For example, the discovery of DNA by Watson and Crick allowed for advances in DNA technology, such as testing for hereditary diseases. As far as ethics, debates on technology center on should we do it rather than can we do it. Ethical issues can arise from new technology and have as much to do with politics, economics, and cultural values as with science and technology. So that was chapter one. We actually covered a lot in this video. Of course, if there's something that you are unclear about, give it another listen, use your textbook for clarification, or use YouTube as your search engine. There are thousands of really good biology tutorials all over the internet. And in the next chapter, we will be covering chemistry.